This video is sponsored by no one, but if you like what I do on this channel and wish to support it, please check out my Patreon, link in the description. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are continuing a dedicated series to uncovering the truth based on facts and documented evidence, while at the same time dismantling politically charged propaganda lies aimed at rewriting history. And we'll do this with reason, logic and correctly contextualized primary sources. I would like to begin this presentation by saying that lies are lies, and it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum they come from. We're always prepared to attack them without hesitation. The idea that the ancient Romans belonged to the Nordic phenotypic type is part of a theoretical system which, generally speaking, was born in Germany and fostered by the likes of Hans Friedrich Karl Günther. We are specifically referring to the set of theories called Nordicism. The idea of the ancient Romans being Nordic, with a stronger emphasis of their ruling elite, is an actually pretty easy argument to attack, but in order to do that professionally, we're going to utilize a systemic data analysis model in order to evaluate the strength and weaknesses of the claim, while at the same time checking its propaganda subroutines. We will also see whether or not this argument is contradictory in its premises, once looked upon through the perspective of period iconography, literary and material evidence, including DNA analysis. We will call this a logic investigation sequence and consistency check criteria. The past is a dynamic continuum. As humans stride across the centuries, a complete ethnic monolithic fulcrum of civilization, particularly when core societies become multicultural due to foreign individual relocation patterns, conquest, citizenship extensions and other factors, is difficult to identify, but it's usually present. Power, success and wealth attract immigration. The city of Rome also attracted immigration throughout its history, particularly from several different types of populations and civilization across the Mediterranean basin. Hence, a certain level of cosmopolitanism would have been encountered within the city. However, at least when it comes to the Italian Romans, a long-lasting continuum of the genetic fabric of the population appears to be demonstrable, regardless of barbaric invasions, slave influx and other external demographic pressures. In other words, the imprint that these socio-political phenomena had on the original population chains is not zero, but it's negligible when looked at the entirety of Roman history. However, a claim such as the Romans were Nordic before immigration and foreign influx within the population ethnic strata requires a statistically significant core of identifiable factors in order to be sustained. Thus, any form of discrepancy between the observable data and the theoretical postulation basis will have to be negligible for the hypothesis to stand. Moreover, in order to determine the ethnic consistency of the Italian Roman people, we will make use of several resources. As we mentioned, literary evidence, iconographic evidence, genetic evidence. Then we'll formulate a consistent hypothesis based on the examination of all reliable information. And as we proceed with our investigation, let's keep in mind one thing. There is no my truth or her truth. There is only objective truth. And today, we will find it. Historically, all sorts of political groups on all sides often made use of vague statements as a form of mass manipulation due to the general lack of resource access and higher understanding of these historical concepts by the masses. Furthermore, if the Romans were indeed Nordic, we would also need to see a high level of Germanic sociolinguistic interference and cultural heritage retention within the Roman world. So, having established all this, what is the integer that would correctly reflect the presence of Nordic types within the Roman population and specifically within the Roman elites? One step at a time. Although on this video we are specifically focusing on the claims concerning the ancient Romans, I'd like to spend a word or two to frame our discussion when it comes to what Nordicism is and what it claimed. Nordicism, as a school of thought, was born between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, with its several cultural circles in Europe and America, having, among its many proponents, the American Madison Grant, the Frenchman de Gobineau and the German Eugen Fischer. According to this ideology, the Nordic phenotypes were culturally and intellectually superior to all other phenotypic variants within the human race. 
the Nordic type being superior also meant that all other lesser racial groups couldn't and wouldn't have achieved anything parallel within history. When it comes to civilization building, culture, warfare, linguistics, architecture, inventions, you name it. And therefore, in the wake of this hypothesis, the Roman Empire becomes a problem, you see. Because how can a southern European empire be capable of such grandeur and splendor if they were lesser beings? Specifically, Gunther, in his book Rassenkunde Europas, which is normally translated in English as The Racial Elements of European History, attributes the creative force of history to the Nordic element within the fabric of the human race. And within a picture that tries to claim ethnic appropriation of all the winners, of course, the Romans would be included. To claim Nordic cultural markers for the purpose of establishing a uniquely superior subgenre of humans, the Roman Empire had to become Nordic. And it didn't end there. According to Gunther, all of the following Italic people would belong to the Nordic types as well. Nordicism was to be seen as an organic extension of the growing vision of Aryan superiority and constructed vision of caste which went beyond the social into the genetic heritage, something you couldn't escape from. That is because any forms of supremacy, regardless of what colour they are based on, unfairly place people within very specific societal units of control before they are even born. Hence, the ancient Romans' claim is methodological. Part of this structure was also to justify colonial operation in Africa, Asia and America, and at the same time to legitimise the rise of northwestern countries in Europe. Coming from the north as invaders, these Nordic types would have allegedly forced themselves and superimposed themselves on the local populations with a dominant role, creating a supposed ethnic separation between the upper class or the ruling elite of more pure Nordic blood and the ruled, belonging to a different ethnic subcluster. If this were true, this would be a very easily demonstrable phenomenon which would have left clearly identifiable marks within the matrix of time. Continuing with the hypothesis, many centuries later, after Italy had already established itself first as a republic and then as an empire, a constant influx of slaves would have polluted irreparably the Nordic blood of Italy, with elements coming from the Levant. It is basically a claim of ethnic replacement, as is often the case with such ideologies. This would have led to the decay of the customs and culture and political collapse of the late empire. Now that we understand the basis of this thesis, let's examine it in details to see if it can be substantiated with evidence. The thesis itself is, academically speaking, extremely weak. The first main problem appears when we start to examine the phenotypic variety of those very slaves that are considered to be the problem in the first place. First of all, this idea that many, if not the majority of slaves that would be brought into Rome were of Levantine origin is absolutely absurd. And just for clarity's sake, when Gunther says Levantine, he means Semitic. During the Roman Republic, the first to trade in slaves with Rome is Cisalpine Gaul, so the Celtic world. According to Cassius Dio, the boy and the rest of the Gauls offered in sale various articles and a particularly high number of slaves. The Roman military campaigns against the Hellenistic kingdoms, against Carthage, in Iberia, surely brought into Rome a very diverse influx of all sorts of ethnicities as slaves. Greeks, Iberic, Illyrians, Syrians. But the wars between the Romans and the Gaul in both Cisalpine Gaul and Gallia Narborensis brought into Rome Celtic slaves, therefore Nordic if you will. And these Gallic slaves would not have been numerically insignificant, in fact they made their own cohesive unit during Spartacus' rebellion, as we all know. Between the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Principate in the Imperial Age, the main Roman military campaigns will take place in Gallia first, with Julius Caesar, then in Britannia, with Claudius, on the Alpine Arch, including various conflicts on the east of the Rhine and Danube borders. By the application of very simple logics, we can see that the result when it comes to influx of slaves coming from all of these different campaigns within the Celtic world would have brought a high number of Nordic types when it comes to the slaves, not the Roman people, and even less the ruling elite. Data also confirms that the impact slaves had on the original genetic pool of Italia is most likely negligible and would need to be substantiated by evidence which is obviously missing, because this is nonsense. Where is the empiric evidence that would supposedly counter the instead established fact that the Celts were the enemies, not the Roman elites, inconsequential? 
There is absolutely no reason to believe that the Roman elite was homogeneously constituted by Nordic types. On the contrary, within Roman society and the perspective of the people, we see a very specific reaction towards the traits of the northern people, which placed them clearly in the category of extravagant, exotic, foreign. Moreover, if it were the case, the existence of a degree of secondary diglossia in the sociolinguistic context of Rome would have been observed, with the upper class speaking a form of Germanic language while the people would have to be speaking Latin. Sign of similarly to how in 1066, during the establishment of the Dutch of Normandy in England, while well, the Anglo-Saxons spoke their own Germanic language, but the elites, the Normans, kept speaking French, which gave birth to the very mixed Germanic and Romance language we today call English. Well, within the Roman world, there is no such thing. If anything, the educated Roman elites wanted to learn to speak Greek, another Mediterranean language that reflects the social cultural power dynamics of the Mediterranean. We have overwhelming evidence that the Nordic phenotype, characterized by very white skin, blonde or red hair, blue or green eyes, is considered by the Romans as something extraneous. These, to the Romans, are the characteristics, the markers of the people of the North, the Celts, the Germanic tribes. Vitruvius writes, the races that receive nourishment in the north are characterized by tall stature, fair complexion, hair straight and reddish, blue eyes. Pliny writes, in the cold areas of the world, opposite to those inhabited by the Ethiopians, we have people that have a candida cute, candid flesh, e flavis promissas crimibus, long blonde hair. The contraposition between the very white Nordic type and the Ethiopian is also found in Lucian of Samosata, a very famous rather of the 2nd century, who wrote in Greek and used these three terms to identify all people. He identified them either as black, white or blonde. Greek and Romans considered themselves white, not blonde. As we continue reading the classics, we'll find more evidence that the Romans perceived the Nordic phenotypic traits with a sense of otherness. For instance, here is how Titus Livius describes the physique of the Gauls. Check this out. He tells us it's particularly incapable of sustaining heat. According to Dionysius of Alicarnassus, a battle occurred under the sun in Latium, and he tells us, once again speaking about the Gauls, as much. The sweat pouring out over their whole bodies would not let them either grasp at their swords or hold their shields firmly, since their fingers slipped on the handles and no longer kept a firm hold. This is a description of the Battle of the Colli Albani from 367 BC, for your reference. The very white but specifically candid complexion of the Nordic people is considered to be so distant from the common looks of the Roman people that it is in fact used by Petronius in a satiricon where we find something very interesting. This is a camouflage scene. Petronius writes, Consider the plan I've discovered. Eumolpus certainly has some ink. Let's change our skin color from hair to nails with this paint in the guise of Ethiopian slaves. We will cheerfully serve you without painful fetters. We will fool our enemies with a change of skin color. Here is another character's reply to this proposal. Oh really? Why not also circumcise us so that we can seem to be Jews? Pierce our ears so that we may imitate Arabs? Or whiten our faces with chalk so he thinks that we are citizens of Gaul? And then he ends, as if color alone could hide our looks. Checkmate. What's fun is that this debunks a whole series of characteristics falsely attributed to the ancient Romans with the aim of claiming what is otherwise historically unclaimable by certain people. We also see with this very passage that not only they weren't as white as the Nordic, but they also weren't black, but considering the fact that I've talked about that extensively on this platform for this time will supersede. But it is specifically understood. They weren't as white as the Nordic. They weren't Nordic. 
The very recognizable elements of the northern phenotypes are used as caricatures, and this happens often in the classics. It is clear that the very white skin and blonde or red hair with blue eyes were not common nor natural in the eyes of the Roman people. But let's move from the literary evidence to the iconographic evidence and let's have a look at Pompey's frescoes. These represent members of the Roman aristocracy in the first century AD. We indeed see people with white skin, but not of the Nordic type. The hair is normally black or brown. This is the norm within the Roman Empire. It's in fact on the 4th century AD that people with blonde hair start to appear more often in the iconography as we see in the mosaics of the Villa Romana del Casale in Sicily, where the Roman military system begins to be strongly influenced by elements originating from the Barbaricum. Now that we have established the norm, we also need to spend a couple of words to identify the fact that yes, some variables and some occasional situations where you had red hair or blue eyes or a blonde colour of hair did indeed happen within the Roman world. This is a normal occurrence which happened within the entirety of the European frame. And some of these traits were also present on a smaller number within the Roman emperors. But there is something I need to tell you, which is from a linguistic perspective that can shed light on something that could otherwise be misleading. This. According to Suetonius, Nero is described as having grey, bluish eyes. According to Pliny, Emperor Octavianus has grey-green eyes. Malassas tells us that Emperor Commodus has blonde hair. And once again, Suetonius describes the beard of Caligola as being aurea, so golden. Still, the reason why this doesn't validate the theory of a Nordic ruling elite is the fact that we also have completely opposite examples. For instance, according to Suetonius, Julius Caesar, so Julius Caesar, had black penetrating eyes. Vespasianus, so Vespasian's eyes, were the color of red wine, so very dark. We have the exact same description of eye colour for Antoninus Pius, still from Malassas. Malassas also tells us that Hadrian had black hair, but bright eyes. But the linguistic note that I was telling you about is the fact that the Romans used two different Latin terms to describe first the blonde colour of the Celts and then the blonde colour of these emperors. So even though these are translated as blonde in English, they are two different terms in Latin. Blaus is the term that is used normally to describe the blonde of the barbarians, whereas the term that is used to describe the blonde hair of some of the emperors is the term subflavum, which as a subcategory could be interpreted as a light brown, what we in Italian today call castano, castano chiaro, a different term for a different chromatic variety. It is also interesting to mention that sometimes the Romans use fantastical explanations for these very foreign, according to their point of view, phenotypic traits. Let's read. One day, as he was returning home in the countryside, Lucius met two twins who ordered him to tell the Senate and the people about a victory that still hadn't occurred. And to demonstrate him their divinity, they touched his cheeks, changing the colour of his beard and his hair from black to red like copper. As another confirmation that the Nordic phenotypic type does not necessarily belong to the ruling elite, we have the Gens Rufia. Clearly the founder of this family would have had red hair, but this is a Gens Plebea. Low class. Nothing whatsoever to do with the likes of Gens Julia. And in a similar way, names such as Flavius, which does mean blonde, and Rufus, which does mean red, on one hand demonstrates the presence of some of these colours within the Roman world, but on the other hand it also determines the peculiar characteristics of it, because they use them to identify them, that's what a name does, you identify someone because of a peculiar characteristic. In other words, in a population that mostly has black hair, you wouldn't call someone black-haired, because that wouldn't set him aside, but in a population with mostly brown and black hair, you would indeed call someone red or blonde, because they are not the norm, they are the exception. And we do see this specific social linguistic behaviour on the other side within the Gauls, where we are told by Vitruvius that the directo capillo, so straight hair, was the norm. And won't you know it, Crixus becomes a name, which means curly-haired, because it's not the norm.
Another very interesting social-cultural phenomenon that happened during this time that can help us understand and pinpoint the extravagance of blonde hair is the fact that we know, because it's mentioned, that several Roman citizens, mostly women, imported wigs from Gallia that were made with the blonde hair of some of the Celtic inhabitants. So, some Roman women, particularly in the upper class, fancied the blonde hair and paid good money to get these wigs. Now, there is a myth, however, that is connected to this, that tells, and you'll find it in all sorts of websites on the internet, which says that it was a law in Rome, or a requirement, for all prostitutes to wear blonde wigs. And this is, it's a myth. I could not find any form of evidence to back this up historically. So what probably is the case is that these were mostly ordered by wealthy Roman women, the most famous of which was Empress Messalina, but because she was a little extravagant from a sexual point of view, the connection was made, but it's not a connection that is backed up historically. So is it possible that a few, let's say, more expensive prostitutes did buy the wigs to please their customers? Absolutely very possible. But when websites do tell you that this was a requirement, no it wasn't. Reading Ovid on the matter, ever since the auburn hair of German women had become known in Rome, Roman ladies were widely eager to have such hair instead of their own. Black. Locks. He also wrote that freed women chose bright colours to harmonise a contrast with their hair. Now, it's important to also underline, however, that even though everything else is correct, the specific detail of black locks was added by Otto Kiefer in his book Sexual Life in Ancient Rome. So that part needs to be removed. The original passage from Ovid does not say black hair, but it's clear that the original hair wasn't blonde, otherwise what would be the point in putting on a blonde wig? But it's important to underline this. When it comes to the full-on interpretation and discussion on the genetic relevance and variance and changes throughout the centuries in Italy, there is a study, there are multiple studies, but there's one specifically that I'd like to mention briefly here to discuss and justify with data my claim that the Italian population hasn't really changed from an ethnic and genetic perspective throughout the centuries, as other people claim. The first genetic history of Rome was laid out by researchers at Stanford University. The study is relevant to our discussion because what was found is that regardless of the European genetic lineages that converged into the ancient city and the limited information we have about the genetic makeup of the population and its denizens, the results of this research demonstrate that the genetic heritage of the Italian people hasn't in fact changed. The ancient Romans were a Mediterranean people and have been at least since the Calcolithic, which is also substantiated by the studies made by Cavalli Sforza. So, all in all, in conclusion of this study, the Roman people were a Mediterranean people, as they themselves tell us. They were not black, but they were not Nordic either. The results of our research and data analysis seem to point to a completely different pattern of identification as that proposed by the likes of Gunther. Therefore, we consider his Nordic theory of the origins of the Roman Empire indefendable.